I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. One of the most difficult aspects in starting to study Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah is getting a handle on just how those ideas developed over time. It's tempting to think that, for instance, Kabbalah has just always existed in the form that we have it, or that Kabbalah is just one thing at all. Of course, neither of these positions is really tenable. Such notions developed greatly through the ages and are still developing, and there are now and there have always been numerous mutually exclusive schools of Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah. This class is meant to serve as an introduction to Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah from the point of view of its incredibly complex development from the prophets of ancient Israel unto the rise of modern Hasidism in the 18th century. Of course, this series isn't meant to be exhaustive by any means, but only should serve as a springboard for deeper study and reflection, and hopefully it will also enable you to accentuate developments in Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah in their historical and cultural context, and hopefully embolden you to dive into the primary texts, which are admittedly as sublime as they are obscure. Let me express my gratitude to Congregation Tchia for allowing me to use these lectures to reach a larger audience here on Esoterica. If you want, you can find the entire series under the playlist Entering the Garden, an Introduction to Jewish Mysticism and Kabbalah. I'll be uploading them over the next few weeks, or if you find these episodes after autumn of 2021 and you want to watch the entire series, you can find them in that playlist. If you find this series on Kabbalah interesting, I'd hope you check out my other content on topics in esotericism and perhaps consider supporting the production of free academic and scholarly topics in occultism, hermetic philosophy, by joining my Patreon or perhaps with a one-time donation. You can find those links below, and I really appreciate your consideration. Now, let's enter the garden of Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah. All right, folks. Well, welcome back. Let's do a little bit of recapping and um, what we got through in, in uh, part one of this talk about the Sefer Zohar, which again is uh, one of the most intimidating books that, that I know of. Um, you know, people talk about how, I don't know, the Phenomenology of Spirit by Hegel is intimidating. Um, I don't know, the Phenomenology of Spirit is like Fisher Price compared to the Zohar, at least in my opinion, trying to understand it. Um, so as we we went through last time, the Sefer Zohar, the Book of Radiance, is a, a mystical midrash, and midrashic literature is just a kind of literature that I sometimes describe as Jewish jazz. Not that there aren't Jewish jazz musicians, but it's sort of like medieval Jewish jazz, the literary level. It's where a person will take a piece of scripture and then riff on it, and then someone will riff on that riff, and someone will riff on that riff until you get something that's completely unrecognizable. But the idea is that you, if you if you know the if you know the guy that knew the riff and he ripped off this riff and that riff came from this riff and if you can do that do the genealogy the same what jazz musician historians can do, midrash works a lot like that in Jewish in the Jewish uh, literary world, and so what we have is a kind of mystical midrash which is sometimes largely a commentary on various sections of the Bible although the Zohar is very uneven some some of uh, like Genesis one one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, or ever how you want to translate it. Um, th that verse gets dozens and dozens and dozens of pages, right? And some other texts don't get much at all. So it's very uneven. It's composed of actually several different works um, combined together. And we talked about some of those minor works within the Zohar, which are self-contained units. Those self-contained units can be uh, very accessible. Uh, the, the Sava or the Yanuka, those sections are relatively accessible relatively accessible. Uh, other sections like the Sifra Nitsniuta, which is only eight pages or so, eight dapim, is completely a mystery. It's one of the most difficult texts in, in all of Kabbalistic history. There have been dozens and dozens of commentaries written on it. It, it began to it emerged in the 13th century in the circle of a fellow named Moshe de Leon, who we think is the principal author, but we now scholars think that uh, there are lots of other folks' hands on this document as well. 
though in the traditional world, in the Orthodox world, um, it gets its legitimacy because it's actually, uh, according to them, traceable back to uh, Shimon Bar Yochai, the uh, second century sage. And what's important about that is on their way of telling the story, right? So the, the, the academic progressive story is that it was composed in Spain, in the area of Leon, which is in northern Spain and Castile, in the 13th century over the course of about 10 years, beginning around 1270 or so, a little after maybe. Um, the traditional story, the orthodox story, is that no, it was actually composed by Shema Bar Yochai in the second century, and it was only revealed to the world in the 13th century. So that it was existed the entire time, it just had only been revealed to the world by Moshe de Leon and his uh, his circle. And some of the core concepts that we dealt with last time are the maybe two of the more difficult concepts to grasp. And one of those is Ein Sof. And this is God in God's most transcendent state, which is to say that you can't say anything about this conception of God. This is a conception of God that's completely transcendent. Nothing is true of it. And you can only talk about it in the negative. So this is a way that you can do philosophy with Kabbalah. Remember that in a big way, Kabbalah, the Zohar, is trying to answer a lot of the same kinds of questions that were relevant in, in medieval Europe at the time, theologically and philosophically. And one of those questions is, can a being beyond all adjectives, beyond all predicates, can we even talk about such a being? And Maimonides famously said, no, all you can do is say God isn't wise because God is wise in a way that you can't possibly understand. And so comparing your wisdom to God's wisdom is blasphemy. And therefore, you must say that God isn't wise. Or perhaps you could say you could speak in double negative, double negatives and say God isn't ignorant. Right. And so if God is infinitely non-ignorant, then we can infer from that logically that God is all knowing something like that. <clears throat> so this being Ein Sof, whatever it is, is beyond all understanding. Now, obviously, it doesn't end there, because if it started, if it ended there, we would not be here, right? Something must have created this world. And so that process by which that happens is through the spherot, the numerations. I'm, I'm, I, ever again, how to translate this word is so difficult. Uh, that's why in most cases, you just see that it, it's left in, in the Hebrew. But it literally, it means something like numerations. It doesn't mean number, because we have a word in Hebrew for number. It's mispar. Uh, and so it's not that, that's the standard noun you would derive from the root of, of, of uh, safar, but it's not, it's spherot, uh, it's in the feminine plural, and so it means something like numerations. And these numerations, <clears throat> there are 10 of them, although we've seen other, other uh, earlier Kabbalists had up to 13, and these are transcendental emanations of the divine. Now, that's just a really complicated way of saying that these are parts of God that flow out of Ein Sof. They flow out of that no thingness. They flow out of the, the vast emptiness of the Godhead. And they flow out, and there are discrete moments in the development of the Godhead, right? God is a process, not a thing in Kabbalah. And so as these things develop, you can, you can tease them out. You can say, oh, that's one. And that one is different than this one because of this. And that one's different than that one because of that. So you can see how these things are different because they're different parts of the dynamic process by which God comes into being. And one way of thinking about Kabbalah, all of Kabbalah, <clears throat> is to imagine that Kabbalah is basically dedicated to the emergence, the development, the dynamism, and the external and internal relationship of the spherot and also the relationship of the Jewish people via Jewish law to the spherot. And we'll see that in a big way tonight. Because what's really important to grasp about the spherot in the, in the Kabbalah, especially in the Sefer Zohar, is that there is absolutely no way of thinking about what they are without thinking about what Israel is and thinking about how Israel interacts with Jewish law. And that interaction with Jewish law has a direct bearing on the metaphysical structure of reality. We're going to get to the idea of tikkun olam tonight, or at least a version of it. And as you'll see, it had nothing to do originally with giving to the poor. It had everything to do with you give to the poor because that act of tzedakah, right, that act of, of righteousness, readjusts the dynamism within the Godhead and corrects the nature of God in some way or realigns it in such a way that it brings about um, a new state of affairs, maybe even a messianic state of affairs. So those are the two big ideas we covered last time. What is the Zohar? How was it composed? Who composed it? Those are all big, complicated questions uh, that we had not solved until the early 20th century, the mid 20th century. In many ways, we're still solving it. The original state of God is Ein Sof, without end or no thingness. 
and then the bridge that emerges out of Ein Sof that reaches down to our world in the form of the spherot or these numerations that first appear, of course, in Sefer Yetzirah. Any questions from last time? I can feel <clears throat> people like to ask questions I can't possibly feel, like why 10 and not 50? Like, I have no idea. Because the Sefer Yetzirah says 10, not 11, 10, not nine. That's why. Yeah, Eric. So perhaps it's a trivial question, but I see Ein Sof sometimes written A-I-N, which sounds more like Ein, uh, or also E-I-N. It's probably just a variant and not a, not a difference in the two. So you would think, and it's it's there's a complicated pun at work in Hebrew, actually. So Ein Sof written with one way of spelling it with an Aleph and one way of spelling it with an Ayin can result in two different meanings of the word. So Ein Sof literally means without end, infinite. It's a it's a it's a negation. But the word Ayin in in Hebrew with an with an uh, the, with a with an Ayin Ayin right it means uh, nothing. So it means nothing, nothingness. And so there's a complex pun on this. Now. What you can you can do is you can, you know, and we'll see this in a minute with the word keter, uh, they'll pun on this, but um, one of the problems is just sort of the Hanukkah problem. How many different ways can you spell Hanukkah in English? Well, a lot, because there's no way of figuring out what to do with the with the dagesh and those letters in, in, in the word Hanukkah. Um, but there is a complex pun going on here too, right? So homophonically, it can sound like the nothingness, but also it can sound like without end. And so there'll be a lot of ideas about the idea of God as a kind of divine nothingness, which for the, the Jewish Buddhists out there, the Jubus, um, Kabbalah and, and Jewish Buddhism, are, they get along pretty well. So I guess I have a follow-up question. And, and I mean, we're not in 13th century Spain. So I just wonder about the pronunciation of Hebrew and Aramaic <laughs> in an environment that was, you know, neighboring and for a good chunk of time, you know, people had, you know, Arabic speaking neighbors and were part of, you know, the Arabic kingdoms of Iberia. I'm wondering if they were distinguishing the pronunciation of Ayn and Aleph the way like Yemeni Hebrew would, um, or if it's like, you know, a lot of modern dialects of Hebrew where you don't even hear the difference. So it's just a, a, write, a written difference. I don't know what was going on in Castile. I have, yeah, to be. In terms of historical linguistics, I really have no idea. My sense of it is that Sephardic Hebrew, at least now, doesn't make a distinction. Now, I don't know when that distinction when when that distinction was lost. I mean, even in the in the Talmud, they talk about people who aren't making a distinction back then, that they're pronouncing Ayin and Aleph as the same, and that's a thing all the way back in the Babylonian Talmud. So, my guess is that. Sephardi Jews, of whom Moshe de Leon was, wasn't making a distinction. But, and, and it's interesting, right, because the pun only works if you, if you don't make a distinction. If you pronounce ayan and ayan as the same, and not ayan and ran. Because if you, if you do pronounce those two consonants, and those are, right, that's a different, one's a glottal stop and one's a voiced pharyngeal fricative. Um, if you do pronounce those differently, then the pun doesn't work. So my sense is because they like that pun, they were reading them identically, despite the fact that 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 Hebrew could have been spoken like. And, and I, this would also require me knowing something about how Maghrebi Arabic was spoken, and I certainly don't know anything about that. So my sense is that because they, that pun that pun is possible to them, and no one criticizes the pun, then they, they must be pronouncing the, the the two letters the same. I guess, but I'm not a historical linguist. I don't know. Again, that would require me to know things about Maghrebi Hebrew or Maghrebi era, um, Arabic and, and Iberian Hebrew in the 13th century that I definitely don't know anything about. <clears throat> Other questions before we jump into the Sfirot? All right, folks. There it is, the image that I think most folks who have some knowledge of Kabbalah, who've even heard the Kabbalah, have seen this image uh, dozens of times. This is the, the classic image. If anyone, if you just Google Kabbalah, this is what's going to come up. And I've put off and put off and put off putting it up because I, the reason why I've put off putting it up is because I don't want you to get fixated on it. 
because this is the image that has locked into people's mind that all of Kabbalah is this. It's about the 10 Sfirot and the Tree of Life, Eitzachim configuration. And it's not. Kabbalah is much more sophisticated. It's much bigger than this. And even this, even this alignment that you see here on the screen right now is an ideal alignment. This alignment will never happen in our lifetime unless the Messiah comes. In the Zohar, they are very clear, the writers of the text are very clear that this alignment is a perfectly balanced vision of what the Sphero are. And it's very clear from the writer of the Zohar that that's not the case because the world isn't perfect. So what you're seeing is an ideal representation <clears throat> of the spherot, not as they are, not as they, as they ever have been, ever in all of history, but as they will be in the Messianic era, right? By Yom HaHu, when Hashem's name is one, right? When everything is unified, then they will look like this, but not until then. So one of the things I just want to scrub in people's minds is that this is what the spherot look like. They don't like this in the Kabbalah, in the Zohar. They do not like this. Because if they did, our world would look very different. Because our world and the supernal world in the Zohar mirror each other. And if our world's out of whack, if anything has happened bad to you today, if anything's bad to happen to anything at all, then that means that the supernal world's also out of whack, which means that these relationships are not in relationship. So the thing that I just want to, again, I'll keep, I'm going to pound this drum. The thing I want to pound about this drum is that this is an ideal representation of the spherot, not how they are. They're always in an inner dynamic relationship, right? God is sort of polyamorously in a relationship with God's self and all the various people, entities within God's self are always out of whack. So what is it that's out of whack? Let's go through them quickly, right? The first spherot, right? You see how this is open at the top? Because that's open to Ein Sof. Everything emerged from Ein Sof. So from up above here, here be nothing. And yet here was everything. Ein Sof is up here. And then in the first thing to emerge was the crown of God, the first apparent thing of God. So this thing, this crown is the inner glory of God. It's the first moment of God's divine will. Because in order for there to be anything, there must be intentionality. And that inner intentionality of God, the first stirring, I mean, this is a part of you, have folks ever woke up before their alarm, like before your alarm goes off? The thing that made you get up before your alarm, the thing that's not even conscious to you, it wasn't like you consciously decided to get up before your alarm. It's that something arose in you to stir you into consciousness before consciousness. Imagine this is the thing that gets up before God's alarm goes off right? Keter is that thing. It's not conscious. It's not a thing even. It's completely unknowable. You can never know the thing that stirred you to get up one second before your alarm, but something stirred inside you and your primordial consciousness. And that first thing is Keter. And we can know nothing about it except for it must have happened. We can logically deduce it because things are here. Keter is completely unknowable. And as you can see here, right at the top, it says I am nothingness because it, it's, it's a kind of knowable nothingness. Ein Sof, Ein Sof is an unknowable nothingness. Keter is a knowable nothingness. Now, in order to wake up, that when you wake up, you immediately come into consciousness. But if you've ever had a sort of surprise wake up, your consciousness happens to you like a flash. Everything's like, right? Oh, your Google map, you know, your Google timesheet shows up and your calendar and your emails and everything. It's like a flash of everything that you have to do for the day. That momentary flash that isn't even consciousness is chokhmah. It's pure undiluted consciousness. That's completely just a flash of everything that you know all at once. Now, obviously you can't dwell in chokhmah because it's like everything that you know coming at you all at once is a gestalt. You have to parse things out. You have to analytically think, all right, now I have to get up. Now I have to get the kids up. Now I have to write this email. Now I have to do this and do this and do this and this. Your consciousness has to, be, has to be compartmentalized into analytical structures. That analytification, that sounds like a real word, that analytification of God's consciousness is Bina. It's God's intelligence at some level, as a, or God's understanding, right, as opposed to God's wisdom. So 
the flash and then the analyticalization of that flash. And you can see how these happen immediately. They're not, they're not brief moment. They're not like long period drawn out. These are like logical deductions from each other. <clears throat> we'll come back to dot in a minute. Dot's a weird spherot, a sphera. Immediately flung from Bina, we have Chesed. Chesed is the Im immediate moment where if you're doing things right, you, you, you know, now you know everything you have to do in the day. The fort is the first thing you should do. Take care of yourself. You know you got a lot to do. What's the first thing you should do? Make some breakfast. Get some coffee. Take care of yourself. This is chesed. This is the part of you that's loving kindness, pure loving kindness. But if you stay in loving kindness, you're never going to get anything done. You can't just love yourself all day. And how do you do that? You judge yourself. I got to get to work. I got to write this email. If I don't write this email, I feel bad. This guy's bothering me on the email. So what do, you, what do you switch to now? Judgment. You have to move out of the world of chesed to the world of judgment. And judgment is a part of you that, that judges. It says, this is worth doing and that's not worth doing. This is the email I'm not going to respond to. Like, I don't, I don't like this guy. Who cares what he says? It's judgment. Judgment, when it's unchecked by chesed, that's evil. If you're just pure judgment, that's terrifying because pure judgment unchucked by any loving kindness can just be violent, vengeful rage. And in fact, in the Kabbalah, as we'll see tonight, this is where evil comes from. Imagine a bowl flowing from Bina to Chesed, right? And then Chesed flows immediately to Guvura. Guvura. Imagine Guvura flows out a little bit. Pure, unchecked judgment flows out. That pure, unchecked judgment that flows out of Gevura, that's evil. We'll get to evil tonight. Now, when all of these things are in balance, all these upper spherot are in balance, that forms the most beautiful thing imaginable. The balance between justice and mercy, between analytical thought and pure insight, between the divine nothingness, that is Tiferet. It's the perfect balance of everything that can be made. Because you know how to judge, you know how to love, you know how to think, you know how to be wise. And Tiferet is the womb of creation. Everything becomes balanced in the womb of creation. From Tiferet, we have Netzach and Hod. Netzach and Hod are very strange little sphere that don't get enough attention, but I think they're very interesting. This is the fact that you have to persist. When you get perfectly balanced, I don't know about you, folks ever gone to the gym and you meet your like fitness goals or you, you reach your intellectual goals or you reach whatever goals you have and you want to just sort of stay there, you can't stay there. You have to continue to grow. Netzach is the part of you that continues to grow. It's a part of you that pushes you a little further than you think you can go. And then hod is a part that's a little more inward, right? Because if you think you can only grow, you have nothing but blind ambition. Well, that's unbalanced. So you need to check it. And what do you check it with? You turn inward. You become introverted. In many ways, Netzach is the principle of God's extrovertedness, and Chod is the principle of God's introvertedness. Those come together in Yesod. And Yesod is something like absolute divine um, unity, concentration. Everything comes together in Yesod. And this is God processing. God is processing out, outward. There's outward momentum. Balanced, of course, right? Because that's how we imagine this thing, although it's never balanced like this. It's balanced between God's exuberance and God's interiority. I, I'm a very introverted person. Rabbi Alana, as you may know, is a very extroverted person. Imagine the two of us combined. We would have somehow have a very curly beard, more hair than I have. Um, both of these things combined is yesod. This is the phallus of the divine. But the phallus of the divine isn't balanced. And so what must you match to it? The vagina of the divine, the vulva, the, 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 the core vagina of the divine and Yesod and Shechina fold in upon each other. I must think about the thing in like three dimensions. They fold upon in on one another and into that folding flows out pure Shechina. And you can see here it's at, it's open at the bottom, almost like a womb, right? It's open at the bottom. And you are here. This is where our world is in the world of Malchut. 
Malchut is kingship, I think better queenship, because the Shekhinah is how we interact with God in this realm, in this part of our, in, the, in this part of reality. We only really approach God as Shekhinah, as the feminine form of God. And so here, this is the area of reception and expansion of God's power. Just as the womb grows to hold a child, God is expanding. This is a part of God that receives all of the other sphere out. And not only that, but God, everything that expands must contract. And so we are in the world of Malchut. We receive the law. This will be very important in a moment. We receive the Torah. What do we do with the Torah? We become pregnant with the Torah. We become wedded to God. Israel is always female. Right. And in, in, in this, in the, in the idea of Kabbalah, Israel is always female. We are wedded to God. We catch in some ways this divine procession. And then by following Jewish law, we throw it back. Right. So it's not just that Malchut and Shechina are passive feminine. That idea is not a Kabbalistic idea. It's not passive feminine that Shechina is. Shechina is also receiving, but very importantly, projecting processing back up recessing back up and everything we do down here gets mirrored back up the entire structure this is the capitalistic solution for the problem we mentioned last time how do you bridge the infinite and the finite you start from the infinite recess of ein sof way up here above kater there are these dynamic moments flowing down all the way shechina and then shechina bounces them all the way back up and that procession and recession continues as long as it must continue until everything is balanced. And that balance, achieving that balance is the goal of Kabbalah. That's it. It's not your denial of your ego. It's not the obliteration of desire. It's not you being whatever, because it's not thought about as you. It's not about you. This text imagines Israel, the, the corporate claw Israel doing this. And so the, the thing here that's at work is the rebalancing of the structure of reality. That, to the Zohar's mind, when you read the Zohar, that's the goal. It's achieving metaphysical, cosmic, interior, communal balance. And that's a metaphysical thing. It's a physical thing. It's all those things because all those things are part of God. So this is the image you've seen. This is the image I'm sure you've seen of the Sfirot. And that is the two minute, three minute explanation of what's going on there. Now, again, what I want to drive home about this is that this is never balanced. It's never balanced because if it were balanced, right? Gavura, we would not live in a world in which there was suffering and violence. Now, it's not to say that in the perfect world, there won't be some kind of violence. There might be all kinds of violence. It just might be that that balance is matched by chesed. Because again, the writer of the Zohar doesn't imagine that in the perfect world, the death penalty will go away. It just imagines it will be executed properly. Because in Jewish law, which is the perfect example of law, according to the Zohar, there are death penalty cases. There's four modes of the death penalty. You can be beheaded, you can be burned, stoned, and strangled to death. So the Zohar imagines that people will be executed, even in a perfect world. But their execution will be just. And it will be part of Gavura being punished, being done correctly. So again, don't put your liberal, progressive, woke ideas on the Zohar. Just don't do it because that's not the way it imagines a world. What's important is to imagine the way it imagines a world. And for it, the Torah, the laws of Moses revealed by God are how this gets balanced out. We'll come back to that more in just a moment. Let's talk about the Shekhinah. I'm sorry for the text being so small on this slide. Uh, I'm not sure why. No, the reason why it is because it's my fault. I put too many text on one slide. It's very simple. Um, the, word, um, the word for shechina is actually coming from the word for uh, to dwell or to settle. The shechina is the thing about God, the part of God, the aspect of God that settles amongst the world. It's a part of God that exists at our register of reality. And this idea has a couple of different historically important uh, precursors that I just want to mention. The first is that uh, you may know this, but you may not, that in the earliest instances of the discussion of Yahweh, Yahweh had a wife. There are really image, early images of Yahweh um, actually having a consort or a wife. 
And this uh, being Asherah, uh, the earliest depictions we have of Yahweh actually depict uh, this being as having had a wife. And so early, early on in Israelite literature, there's always a very difficult relationship with the idea that God could have a feminine consort. And one way of dealing with that was to condemn everything dealing with femininity and everything dealing with the feminine aspect of God, especially Asherah and punishing the worship of Asherah. The other thing you can do with that is sublimate that in good old classic Freudian terms. What that means is that there are all kinds of aspects of God that you sort of get divinized, particularly God's wisdom. And if you've ever read the book of Proverbs, it's a long section where wisdom becomes almost a kind of feminine God where she's described as perfect and beautiful, and, and she's contrasted with the alien woman, the, the uh, Isha Zara. But there's an idea that wisdom can be personified and maybe even deified, and that idea is going to become hugely important in the Zohar later. Also, the idea that God has a kind of presence in the world that's distinct at some level from God, that God can appear as the angel of the Lord, or God can appear as a... Uh, as a fire coming down the mountain or dwelling in the, in the Mishkan or as a pillar of fire during the day, there is an idea that God's manifestation in the world can be different than God somehow, that, that, that there are two possibilities of the, the reality of God. And what ends up happening by the time of the Babylonian Talmud is that this term for the presence of God is sometimes referred to as the Shekhinah. This is the presence of God. Literally, the word means presence or indwelling. And while the, the noun here is fem, in the feminine gender in Hebrew, it's never the case in the Talmud that they think of the Shekhinah as a woman, as a feminine gendered woman gendered entity, because they just think of it as a grammatically feminine noun, not as a woman. So as you might imagine, when the Zohar, part of what the Zohar is going to do is that the Zohar and the Sefer Bahir are going to be mystical not in that they read things in very elaborate, very obtuse ways, which they'll do that too, but how they read things very literally. And if the text says the Shekhinah, and the Shekhinah is in the feminine gender, it must be feminine, full stop. It just is. It's, it's not just a grammatical reality, it's an ontological reality. And what we'll see in the Talmud that it is the case that there often is bridal language used. So for instance, one of the things that you may know is that there are a couple of books of the Bible that the rabbis were always very, very, very nervous about. One of those was Kohelet or Ecclesiastes. Another one of those books that the Bible is very concerned about was Esther because it never mentions God. And another one of those books that the Bible is very concerned about was the Song of Songs because it's about teenagers having sex. And that seems weird. So the rabbi said, look, it's not about teenagers having sex. It's about the relationship between God and Israel. Well, if God is the masculine partner in that relationship, well, what does that leave Israel? What well, leaves Israel the feminine partner? Well, some further speculation said, well, no, it's not Israel being feminine. It's another part of God. And so we have this idea developing over time, and there could be an entire long series of lectures on the development of the Shekhinah. But what we see that over the course of about a thousand years, this concept goes from being a um, grammatical construct with, a, with an element of God living in the world to being an ontological metaphysical construct with actually God being feminine. So there's a lot of complicated things going on in that. Also, what's pointing, worth, worth pointing out here, and I don't want to dwell on this too long, is that in the old Gnostic mythology, this is the mythology that developed um, primarily in texts like the Apocryphon of John and some other texts as well in the Nagamati Library and in the, in the larger Gnostic world. Uh, the Gnostics, as you may remember, were a group of Jews and Christians and pagans who believed that, that uh, knowledge as opposed to faith liberated you from this world. That if you knew certain kinds of things about this world, you could escape from it. And that's what, you know, it's knowledge saving you as opposed to faith saving you or belief saving you. In the Gnostic worldview, there was a divine emanation scheme, just somewhat similar to what we find in Kabbalah later and similar to Neoplatonic stuff and Middle Platonic stuff, where God flows out of God's self. And at the very last rung of that process, there's a disaster. And that very last uh, rung is, a, is an entity called Sophia, wisdom a very similar entity we find in, um, in the book of Proverbs. 
And Sophia wants to create something without reference to the divine world. And she ends up creating an abomination. This thing is called Yalda Baoth, which is probably a Hebrew word that means chaos child. And this it is, it's um, this, uh, the text describes it as, as a living abortion, which is something you know, really dreadful about that idea. But it, it, it's alive and not alive. It's ignorant and blind and chaotic. And it, it creates an entire world to mirror itself and its insanity. And that world is our world. Our world is the world of that evil entity creating it. And the world is just a tr prison for us. It's a giant trap. And so what ends up happening, and not to rehearse this too much, is that there seems to be some good evidence to say that elements of that kind of mythology survived in Judaism a lot longer than it survived in Christianity. We see similar elements to that in the Sefer by here, where it describes um, wisdom, chokhmah, as a, a maiden from a far off land or a maiden from a foreign land cast into our world. So we think there may be connections all the way back to the late classical world and this sort of Gnostic worldview, which again, that term is a bit pro problematic in a lot of ways. But we think that maybe the term emerged from that milieu. The last thing I want to say about the origins of the of the uh, of the Shechina are two things. One is we're living in 13th century Spain. If you know anything about courtly culture, idealizing remote women is all the rage in troubadour literature. It's all about the the ideal woman who's completely uh, virginal and you know you have to sing all these praises to her, but you can never have her. Uh, this courtly literature is a huge part of Spanish literature, both at the literary level, but also at the troubadour level. And so there's an enormous outpouring of, of, of infinite longing for the unapproachable woman. And so we have that happening at the, at the literary level and at the musical level, at the popular level. Also, the other thing I should point out here that's also very important is at the same time that this is going on in the Jewish world, the Marian cult in the Catholic world in Spain is also getting steam. The adoration of the Virgin Mary was not always a big deal in the same way that it is now. That really began in Spain. And the adoration of the Virgin Mary was very, very popular. And so there's some reason to believe that the adoration of the Virgin Mary, that the Shina, the development of that may have been a Jewish response to the larger hegemonic culture, where the Jewish response was, look, we're, they're trying to convert a bunch of us. And what's really popular is this whole Virgin Mary thing. Well, we got that. We don't, it's not even Virgin Mary. We got God. God's a woman. God does all the stuff, the cool stuff Virgin Mary does. And so if you read the Zohar carefully, a lot of the stuff it says about the Shekhinah looks a lot like the kind of stuff that developed in the Marian cult. And so unsurprisingly, the minority culture is mirroring in a very sort of uh, um, hybridity way. Think of someone like Homi Baba. But they're, they're hybridizing the Marian cult and developing a hybridized version of it. And that hybridized version, leaning on their tradition, becomes the Shekhinah. There's a lot of debate about that, but I, I find it to be a very convincing um, analysis, especially when you take some post-colonial studies and apply it at some level to that stuff. I think it makes a very compelling point about the origin of the Shekhinah being something that's developed in Judaism as a response to what's going on in larger Spanish culture, both literarily and in song, but also with the Marian cult. And again, we use the word cult here not to diminish their religiosity. It's just a, uh, we use the word in religious studies, we use the word cult to indicate a very specific acute kind of uh, attention, religious attention. It's in the Zohar that the Shekhinah becomes an explicitly feminine aspect of God. In the Sefer Bahir, we have we have echoes of this, we have murmurs of this, but it's in the Zohar that it's no doubt that there is a definitively feminine aspect of God. And at some level, that's the aspect of God that human beings deal with. And this 10th Sphira, Malchut, the world of indwelling, the world of kingdom, is often, uh, is often tied to Rachel, who's, uh, as you probably know, is uh, associated with mourning. And so the world of Malchut is, uh, is associated with the color black, because of Rachel, all of the various spherot are associated with colors, with uh, matriarchs and patriarchs. They're all associated with all kinds of parts of the body, as you probably saw in the diagram. There's all kinds of things they get associated with. What the writer of the Zohar does is something very interesting. When they want to find where the Shekhinah is, they will rely on the fact that anytime that you see the word et in Hebrew, et, as you may know for folks who know some Hebrew, it's just a direct, uh, direct, it's a direct object marker in Hebrew. It doesn't get translated. 
So if you want to see it, for instance, in the very beginning of Genesis, I have the very first uh, verse of, or part of the first verse of Genesis here, right? Better sheep, but I Elohim es hashemayim veharatz. So, so better sheep, but So uh, in the beginning, um, he made, namely God, what? S, et. Right, I'm gonna make check my Hebrew pronunciation to be use correct academic Hebrew. Et. God created et. Now to read this grammatically correctly you would say in the beginning he created who created god elohim gods <laughs> at direct object marker what did god create hashemayim veharetz god created the heavens and further direct object marker the earth so in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth no because the torah would never just throw words around so the et here aleph tav and aleph tav cannot just be superfluous. They can't just be random direct object, mar uh, direct object markers. What are they? It's the Shekhinah. It's the Shekhinah. And so they say, no, this is the world of the Shekhinah, that this world perhaps is the world of Sefirot, and that after the Shekhinah is Hashemayim Ve'erharetz. The heavens come first, and then the then Shekhinah dwells in the earth, the, ha the Aretz. And so what we have here, right, in the Eretz, so we have is a very Kabbalistic reading, also an incredibly literalistic reading of the Bible, where a direct object marker, et, is not just a direct object marker. It's the creation of the, or the emanation, rather, of Shekhinah into the heavens, and then further the Shekhinah into the earth, into the world of Malchut, into the world, our world. They make a lot of big deal about this. The Zohar is all about this, because it means that, that Shekhinah dwells in the heavens, and she dwells in the earth. And that's in our world. And notice where, notice who does not dwell in our world? Elohim, right? Elohim, and certainly doesn't bara, because bara is creation with no subject doing the creating. It's just he creates, or creates, you could say. What creates? Nothing, right? In the beginning, nothing created. What, what did nothing create? Elohim, the sphere wrote, and then what flowed from them? Shekhinah. And where is Shekhinah? Hashimayim ve'et haretz. For the Kabbalists, for the Zohar, they see the entire structure of the Sefirot echoed in the first six words of the Bible. Again, not because they're reading things out of it that are unusual, but rather because they're reading it incredibly literally. <laughs> incredibly literally. So... What's fascinating about this is that, again, it shows you something about how the Zohar works in terms of uh, Kabbalistic hermeneutics and also why this text is very difficult, because if you don't read Hebrew very well and you don't understand Hebrew grammar very well, then this is all basically lost on you or could be lost on you. So what's going to happen in all of this is that, sphere, that the, the world of Malchut is joined with the supernal world and what is called Yehud or unification. This is kind of a sacred marriage. And what's going to happen according to the uh, world of uh, the world, our world, is that the, the task of our world is to take the Shekhinah, which is an exile, and this idea that God's presence is in an exile is found in the Talmud. When Israel goes, goes into uh, exile and into the Galut, so does Shekhinah go into the Galut. And our task is to reunify the Shekhinah, which is in Galut, in this world, with the supernal world. And as we do that with the process of Jewish law, it's the case that we, we remarry, we marry Shekhinah, and Shekhinah remarries the upper world, and then everything is like a giant lock, and it all clicks into place, and ultimately everything is resolved. Everything, the, the imbalance is resolved. Now, why does that imbalance happen? The, the Zohar never says. And as we get later on next time into Lurianic Kabbalah, we will learn why according to at least Lurianic Kabbalah, why the, the primordial imbalance happened. And then we'll get a big, there's a big drama about why it happened. We'll get to it next time. So what ends up happening here is that we are plunged into matter and we have to return back by redeeming matter. Now, what's different about, for instance, Kabbalah and maybe Gnostic text is that there's nothing wrong with matter. It just needs to be redeemed. Just like a coupon. There's nothing wrong with a coupon but a coupon needs to get redeemed. And so the idea is that you redeem matter, not that you escape it, not that you betray it, not that you get rid of it. It's not bad or evil, but it's in need of redemption. And how does that redemption happen? It happens through this spiritual process 
of um, being reunified with uh, the with the supernal world. Even what happened in the Garden of Eden in the Garden of Eden that really went awry, it's not really clear what went awry, is that there's some indication, at least in some sections of the of the Zohar, that what ended up happening was that Adam became so infatuated with the supernal world that he abandoned his material wife, that Adam was actually too pious. So notice this is a complete inversion of the Garden of Eden story. In the Garden of Eden story, it's that in the original version, it's that human beings are too worldly. They're too sexual. And that version is that they committed sex or whatever. They did some kind of thing or whatever it was. And that being focused too much on their bodies, what messed them up. No, in this, in the Zohar version, Adam is actually too fixated on the Shekhinah and his partner, Chava, life, physical world, feels abandoned by him. She She's not satisfied by him. She's not being, being uh, you know, he's, she's, he's, he's not doing his duty. And that's what allows her to be seduced by the Nachash, by the snake. And so the traditional version is all the blame put on her. She gets tricked by the snake. But in the Zohar's version, at least one version of the Zohar's version, it's his fault. He's a negligent husband because he's so focused on the supernal world that he's not focusing on the physical world, which is his world. The physical worlds are a world. And the Zohar is very clear about this. You cannot focus just on the spiritual world. You can't not re- become a monk. There's no mystical Kabbalistic monks. You are obliged to deal in this world. And it's only by dealing in this world that you can actually deal with the spiritual world. So again, how does this get fixed? Well, Moses eventually comes and gives us the Ten Commandments or gives us the Torah. And it's by combining the spiritual and the physical Again, the Zohar is all about balance, combine the spiritual and the physical, that we begin to climb the ladder again. Adam focused too much on the world of the supernal. Other patriarchs focused too much on the world of the, of the terrestrial. And the idea is we must combine them into one another. And this becomes incredible. The language here is always incredibly sexual. The language is, the, the, the Zohar is very at home with sexual language. Because sex is part of human life. Sex is part of religious observance. You have to have sex. You're obliged to have to be fruitful and multiply. And again, it imagines a, a court, of course, it's imagining a very hyper uh, heteronormative way of thinking about this. Although I think at the edges of the text, there's a lot of interesting homoeroticism and there's a lot of queering stuff that one can do with the Zohar in a way that I think is very, very rich. And it's not that I think it's very rich. Queer people, trans people have done incredible things with the Zohar that have shown that this text is hyper heteronormative but at the same time many of the ideas it commits itself to don't conform to that it can't logically and so there's been all kinds of cool studies that show that those categories break down pretty rapidly when you get a little bit um a little bit under the the hood or under the sheets of what's going on in the zohar there's a lot more happening here well the idea ultimately is that there's a kind of sacred marriage between israel and the shechina and the shechina and israel with the sephirot and by the observance on the uh, on the Jewish law as a kind of uh, ritual act of intercourse, the observance of law is kind of thought of as a kind of intercourse. That as you do the law, you're kind of having spiritual intercourse with the divine, um, because it's only be- it's only because the Jews have a covenant with God, a marriage contract with God, that they can do the things they can do. The only similar thing to that in Jewish custom is sex. It's only by having a certain kind of relationship with a certain kind of person that you can have sex with them. Well, because God and Israel have this relationship, then it must be the case that all of these 613 rules are fundamentally a kind of intercourse with the divine. And so it's thought of incredibly in erotic terms. And so this is very much linked to things like Shabbat. And as we'll see next time, Shabbat becomes incredibly linked in in Kabbalah as sort of the the core observance. In fact, if you've ever done Kabbalah Shabbat, which I imagine most people in this this, uh, class have, Kabbalah Shabbat is a completely invented service by uh, a 16th century Kabbalist to reenact the marriage between God and Israel every single week. So if you've ever sung Lechadudi, that's the reason why you sing it. It's because you're getting married every week. To the, to the Shabbat bride. And that idea comes directly back from Zohar and it's become so in, in, ingrained in Jewish customs that it's now a service that basically every Jew does every week. They do. In fact, I would say even liberal Jews, if they only go to shul once a week on Friday nights, 
they're doing Lachar Rudi, they're doing Kabbalah Shabbat. So they're, they're doing the Hieros Gamos, they're doing the sacred marriage uh, as it is understood here in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the Kabbalah. Now this hyper-focus on sex is probably a dig at the Catholics. Um, one of the things that uh, Judaism did have going for it, that Catholicism didn't, is that Catholicism is really down on sex. And I don't know if you know this about people, they like sex. People love sex. It's a big thing. They like it. They get down on it. People pay for it. People sell it. Uh, it's a big part of the internet. It may be the reason why the internet exists, basically. We may just be piggybacking on like video games and sex. Um, so I think that's actually true. It's probably we piggyback, we piggyback on military intelligence, uh, Pornhub, and, uh, and uh, video games. And I think now video games and military intelligence are probably the same thing, too. So at any rate, um, it's very much the case that uh, part of this whole attitude towards sex, this very hyper, again, hyper uh, heteronormative and very much in the marriage environment. But it's also the case that this is probably a dig at Christianity because Christianity is all about priestly celibacy. It's all about the perpetual virginity of Mary. And it's all about the fact that Jesus and Paul were never married and I suppose never had sex. And the Jews at the time, the rabbis at the time are like, yeah, that sucks. <laughs> sucks for them. They got to be celibate. Mary never got to have sex, or at least she only had sex with God, kinder, or whatever. And Jesus and Paul never gotten married, never had sex. Like, they're inferior. Even the average rabbi down the street doing some Kabbalah gets laid at least once a week. And your God never got laid? Pity for your God, right? Your main prophet, Paul, was like, hated his body, hated having sex? Something wrong with him. Like, we ain't got that kind of problem around here. So... I think also a lot of this hypersexual stuff going on in the Zohar is also a dig at Christianity. I think it's a dig at Catholicism, and I think it's a dig at their relationship to the physical body at some level. And again, part of it's about maintaining your Jewish community by saying, yeah, you can have sex. It's great to have sex. In fact, you're obligated to have sex. You have, you've got to have sex. But know that your sex is part of this mystical thing, and it's very carefully constrained, right? So it's, those things are also true as well. Now, if there's good stuff like sex, there's also bad stuff. Of course, that's evil. And evil in the Kabbalah is thought of as part of God. This is called the Sitra Ahra, the other side. Now, what's important to know about the history of evil in the Jewish world and in the Christian world is that evil in the classical theologies of both these worlds was thought of as basically a kind of privation. That evil was something like cold. Cold is just a lack of heat. Darkness is just a lack of light. Darkness is nothing on its own. Cold is nothing on its own. And so because these things are just negations of something else, they don't really exist. So evil is just a non-existent place where God isn't. It's just a, it's where it's a part of you that rebels against God. It's part of your heart, according to Augustine, that rebels against God. You empty your heart of the divine grace and that emptiness inside your own heart, that God-shaped whole, that's evil. And because of Satan is just a, a pure rebellion, Satan's just pure negation. Well, this is true of Neoplatonism. It's true of lots of different traditions within Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. The rabbis of the Kabbalah, especially in the Castilian Kabbalah and in the Zohar, say, no, evil's real. And it's not hard to imagine why a medieval Jew could be very convinced of the reality of evil. Evil was part of their world. I mean, they didn't face pogroms in Spain, but they knew about pogroms. They didn't face annihilation the way they did in Germany. But the, the creeping reality of the Reconquista, no Jew in their right mind in 13th century Spain had any pretensions that once they were done with the Muslims, that they were not going to come for the Jews. Evil was real. So we're not going to have this philosophical horse crap, horse shit. Yeah, we're not going to have this uh, idea that evil's not real. Evil's real. And if evil's real, it must come from God because everything comes from God. Everything flows from Ein Sof. So where does it come from? Well, we'll think back to this image and we talked about it just a minute ago. So Keter flows into Chokhmah. Chokhmah flows into Bina. And it, these, it, and again, you can imagine sort of a, a rush of water, a rush of light. And as it rushes out, it sort of gets caught by Chokhmah. And then as it rushes back over to Bina, it gets caught by Bina. As it rushes over to Chesed, it gets caught by Chesed. But as Chesed rushes over to Gevura, Gevura can't catch it all. There's so much power flowing now that it hits into Gevura, 
and it's like a bowl when you pour water into it some of it runs out the side or it's like in the the, the famed image in the zohar the, the image that zohar loves better than any other one is the image of the blacksmith anvil as you forge a, an item in a blacksmithery right in a smithery you pound on that hot metal and the only way you're going to get a fork or a knife or a spoon or a sword or whatever is you pound it you have to pound that metal there's no way you can shape the, the unformed metal without pounding on it. And as you pound on it, sparks fly off, shards of metal fly off, dross pours out. And it's an inevitable part of creating something. When you create something, it throws off sparks. And those sparks are burning and dangerous. And they're dross, they're, they're wreckage. In the Zohar, that wreckage, that dross, those sparks, that excess of pure, of, of gavura, of pure rage, righteous rage. You can imagine what ends up happening is that it flows out of gavura and it coats the entire backside of all of the other spherot, like a kind of evil coating, a darkness, a kind of hatred, a rage, an inversion of each one of these. And as it, as it coats the backside of them, that forms another reality. And that other reality is the world of the Sitra Ahra, the other side. These are like inverted, evil, negative image spherot. So horrifying that the first three don't even survive. They, they're so absolutely evil that the will of God destroys them, that they are annihilated. They can't even exist at all. They're so they implode in their own uh, absolute negativity, like a black hole or something. But the other seven, right? So the first three implode and vanish. The last seven, they continue to exist. Oh, I should say this about Bina or about Da'at. Sorry. Uh, in some schemes of this, you may see another sphere out here, another sphere out right here. It's called Da'at. It means knowledge. Um, the reason why there might be another sphere out here is because Keter, because it's so not a thing, they don't count it as real, and you need no, you just you need something else to make the tin up, and Da'at becomes a kind of pseudo sphere. It gets really complicated. We we can't get into it for the purpose of this class, but it, it ends up being a balance between the in com, the completely nothingness of Keter of Chokma and Bina, and the balance of these three, just like the these are balanced here, these four are balanced in Teferit. You get a balancer here in dot, but often you'll see it drawn with sort of like a, like a dot, 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 dot circle to be dot. If you have questions about that, we can get to that later in the Q and A. At any rate, that dross is thrown off and that becomes evil. For the Zohar, evil's real. It's a necessary aspect of reality and you can't get rid of it by anything other than refining it. You can't get rid of it except for by refining it. You have to subject it to purification. And how does one purify it? One purifies it by the process of Ol Siyas Tikkun Olam. Now, as we get to later on, uh, what's important to know about this, and we're going to go maybe a little bit over, but I think we'll, we'll get a lot of this done. So the Zohar doesn't imagine evil as an inherently bad thing. It imagines it as, a, in, as an excess of something that has to be tempered. And you temper it by rectifying it, by, by, by fixing it. And in the later Lurianic Kabbalahs, we'll get to this later on, this becomes the shards or the klipot, these, in, these demonic entities, demonic angels almost, that rule the world of darkness. And that world of darkness can creep into our world. And one of the uh, lines in the, in, the, in the book of Genesis that the Zohar really harps on in this is it talks about the seven Edomite kings that died. And this is a throwaway line, I think Genesis 22 or something, that it seems like that this, these lines don't have anything to do with anything. They're just a bunch of Edomite kings that died. No, not for the Zohar. They're the primordial evil worlds that exist. And you have to deal with them. And you have to deal with them by rectifying them. And the thing that the Zohar is the most um, uh, worried about, the thing that it harps on the most, more than I think anything else, is the same kind of thing the Catholics harp on. And that's masturbation. My God, the Zohar is horrified of sexual sins, especially masturbation. And there's the idea that if one uh, wastes seed, then that seed, the, the spent semen that's just sort of lying there on, I don't know, it becomes demons. It just becomes like more and more and more demons. And the world gets, gets more and more imbalanced and more tilted to the side of the other side. Also, the uncleanliness of so-called uncleanliness of menstruation. This is a uh, 
deeply horrifying world. In fact, so much so that because of the primordial sin of Eve, she is the sort of representative of evil in the world because her menstrual blood is like a dross thrown off by her by her uh, menstrual cycle. And the menstrual blood is just like the dross thrown out in the process of creation where creation uh, was sort of didn't occur. A baby wasn't born. Again, this is all super problematic in lots of ways. Um, but the idea is the blood flowing out of her mirrors the dross thrown off in the process of creation, whereby you get this sort of not createdness. Um, and there's a ton of interest in evil. The Zohar abounds in discussions of evil, and it's probably leaning very heavily on discussions of even to be found, evil to be found in uh, the earlier Kabbalists of Castile. Remember the Cohen brothers, they were very interested in, in, in evil. They wrote the treaties of, on the emanation of the left-hand side. And so there are tons and tons of things about evil, especially anti-Gentile stuff. So we have to be very honest. The Zohar hates Gentiles overwhelmingly thinks Gentiles are corrupt and evil and dangerous and bad. This is not an ecumenical text. Uh, by any structure, any stretch of the imagination, you cannot read this text and imagine that this text has anything good to say about Gentile people, non-Jewish people. It is very negative on them. And so, again, are you that surprised? Again, imagine being Jewish in 13th century Spain. Do you, got, do you have positive interactions with non-Jewish people, with, with Christians? Not really. And so it's unsurprisingly, they're going to have a pretty negative uh, attitude when it comes to non-Jewish people. Now, does that mean that the, that the Zohar is inherently bigoted? It might. It might mean that it's a bigoted text, especially if you take those same attitudes and apply them to non-Jewish people now. Yeah, it's going to result in you being real bigoted, mystically bigoted, probably the worst form of bigotry. So we have to own the fact that that stuff is in there and deal with it as Jews. If you want to study the Zohar and study the Kabbalah, you have to understand there are bigoted things against non-Jewish people there, and you have to deal with them in whatever way you think it's fit to, to deal with them. Um, and they can lean on that because the historical character of Shema Briochai himself was heavily oppressed by the Romans and the Roman colonial project in Judea. And also Shema Briochai says some of the most shockingly anti-Jewish, uh, uh, anti-Gentile stuff you can find in the entire uh, Talmud. I think he says once that the only thing that uh, that, that Gentiles and snakes share the same thing in common. They're both without, they're both better without heads. That stuff is terrible for those of us who non-Jewish people are a huge part of our life. Uh, that stuff is unconscionable. It's there. It's in the Talmud. It's in the Zohar and we have to deal with it. You shouldn't ignore it. It's there. Now can anti-Semites pick up on that stuff and claim that the Talmud is racist and hates Gentile people and can, uh, can the, they can do the same thing about the Zohar. They don't know the Zohar very well, so they won't do that, but it's there too. Just so just so you anti-Semites know, you can you can also attack us with the Zohar too. They don't know that because they don't take the time to actually read this stuff. Um, the demonology of the Zohar is very complex. You have numerous, numerous, numerous stories of demons in the Zohar. And that's not surprising because you have the exact same kind of demonological stories flourishing in Christianity at the time. This is the exact same time that you get a rapid rise in demonology in the Christian world as well. And so, again, unsurprisingly, Jewish and, demon, Jewish and Christian demonologies are sort of uh, developing at pace with one another at this time period. And eventually this will give rise to the concept of the Dybbuk. And we'll get to the Dybbuk in a little while when we get to concepts of possession and exorcism in Judaism that begin to emerge primarily in the, um, the late 16th century. So the Dybbuk, if you, if you heard of the idea of the Dybbuk, it emerges, it's going to emerge primarily, at least originally at some level, in the Zohar. Last thing for tonight, last thing for the night. Um, what's really important about the, uh, the, the Zohar is that it's an incredibly conservative text, which is to say it wants to defend rabbinic tradition. It's very wed to rabbinic tradition. There's no interest in sort of bucking rabbinical tradition. Now it interprets things in rabbinical tradition in very exotic and very avant-garde ways, but it's very worried about philosophers because philosophers are the most dangerous people in the world, y'all. I don't know, you know, I don't know if you know about us, but we're dangerous people. And that's why they kill us from time to time. And one of the things that worried the writers of the Zohar is that the philosopher, the Jewish philosophers at the time, like Maimonides, argued that basically all the weird stuff in the Torah is just symbolism. It's just metaphor. And really, God is really concerned about you being reasonable, being rational, being a good person. And if you understand the Bible in more terms than that, you're probably engaging in some kind of stupid idolatry because you just don't know better. You're not really trained as a philosopher. 
The danger with that, folks, is that Jews are facing an overwhelming pressure to convert beginning at this time in 13th century. Very strong pressure to convert. They can be given land and title and deeds. They can be given all kinds of encouragement to convert. Conversion is very, very attractive. And again, forget, we're, we're 190 years out, 200 years out from the Alhambra decree in 1492. The pressure is already on for Jews to convert. And as you could imagine, a, a wealthy Jewish doctor, wealthy Jewish poet, wealthy Jewish, I don't know, rabbi, who's having a lot of pressure to convert, if he's, an, if he's a Maimonidean and believes that really God's the kind of metaphor and the Jewish law is the kind of metaphor and angels are the kind of metaphors, why the hell are you going to stick your neck out for a bunch of metaphors? If Jesus and God and Moses and they all kind of come out the same in the wash and you get to keep your job and flourish and get new land, you best believe those people converted. They converted not because they hated their religion, but because they were educated enough or perhaps too much that they could say, look, I can, I can still worship my God inwardly. I can still believe in all the things I believe in. And I can pray in a church because praying in a church gets me deals, gets me a deal, gets me a title. So why not convert? The Zohar says, because you mess up all the reality. That's why you stupid, dangerous, bad Jew. Why? Because the very way that you create, you, you, the very way that God engineered reality was that you reverse engineer it and correct it by following the Torah. You have to understand what are called the Ta'ame Mitzvot. And Ta'ame Mitzvot are the reasons for the commandments. The commandments in the Torah are not random. They're not made up things. When God says to put the felon on, when God says where it sits this, when God says honor the Sabbath on this day, on this day and not Sunday, when God says do this and do this, this, God's not telling you random things. God's telling you that this is a roadmap for the, not just a roadmap for piety, but a roadmap for the reconstruction of reality. <laughs> this is how you fix the world. And not only that, God's telling you not just to follow these rules because you should follow them. God's telling you to follow the rules because God follows them. God kept Shabbat. God puts on tefillin. God puts on a talit, the talis. God puts on, God does everything that you're supposed to do. This is imitatio day. The task is not for you to do a bunch of rules. The task is to, for you to follow the rules because God does those rules. And insofar as it, God does those rules and you do those rules, you are co-creators of the perfect world. And it's only by doing that, it's only by following the Jewish law scrupulously, especially the rules that make no sense. It's only by following those rules that seem to make no sense that you have any chance at all of fixing the world, of balancing out the, the world of Sfirot. You, the only way you can do this, the only way that the world will be fixed is by Jews being observant Jews. So again, to drive this point home, the Kabbalah is not liberal, hippy-dippy Judaism. The Kabbalah is the most radically, legally conservative Judaism you can imagine. And why? Because the esoteric meaning of the mitzvot is that they are actually part of the reconstruction, recreation, renovation of the world. The renovation of the world, tikkun olam, the reparation of the world. And it's only by following the Jewish law as scrupulously as possible especially the parts of it that don't make any sense, is that accomplishable? So in the same way that God created the world and God mandated the various holidays, the mandating of those holidays is not just you doing things. It's not just Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and Pesach, whatever. It's these are divinely mandated temporal structures in which one can correct the world at a very specific way at a very specific time that you can't correct the world any other day of the year. You have special powers that day, right? And you have to correct the world. And the Zohar loves, for instance, very minor holidays. Sometimes you travel to Israel, they'll ask you what a Jewish holiday is because they're trying to weed out, I don't know, rabble rousers, actually bore, right? They're trying to weed out people. Well, you, I've always wanted to mess with them, right? And say, yeah, my favorite holiday is Shemini at Seretz. Shemini at Seretz, the most obscure holiday ever. But the Zohar says Shemini at Seretz is the most important holiday in the world to come there will be no more important holiday yom kippur will be a joke 
but Shemini Yetzirah, it's a completely obscure holiday, right? At the very end of the Chagim. No, that's what's really important because that's what's going to be important in the world to come, right? Um, so all of the holidays get these heavily mystical meanings. The counting of the Omer, something that seems completely ridiculous. You're counting down the days to bring a piece of like grain to the thing that we don't even do anymore. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. The counting of the Omer is incredibly important because you're not just counting down the Omer, you're counting down to the reception of the Torah. So you get to replay the entire process again. So everything becomes heavily imbued, heavily imbued. If you've ever stayed up late on Shavuot, if you've ever done a tikkun on Shavuot, stayed up late on Shavuot studying, well, you've done something Kabbalistic. Why? Because the entire process, right, is by receiving the Torah again. You have to be up all night studying to receive it again. And so you get a completely cyclical theory of time. The, the, the Zohar is imagining a cycle, and that cycle gets you, and it spirals up, right? You start from here. You cycle and cycle and cycle and cycle and cycle and cycle until eventually you reach, we reach the world of the divine. And it's through the process of the rectification of the divine, tikkun olam, that the world's redeemed. Now, this gets liberalized in our modern conception, right? It means like be a good person and do nice things and, you know, you'll you know, make the world a better place. The Kabbalists do not imagine it as like make the world, this world a better place. It's the idea that you're renovating this world metaphysically, ontologically, cosmologically. And so that idea is found deeply, deeply, deeply in the Sefer Zohar. So folks, these are the major themes of the, of the Zohar. These are the big themes. If you were to read the Zohar, study the Zohar, you would see these themes over and over and over again. It's like, uh, again, it's like jazz. They're going to they're gonna take these themes and play them over and over again. And there are other themes, there are other minor themes that are important, but these are the big ones. Ein Sof, the Sefirot, the Shekhinah, the balancing of the Sfirot, the idea of uh, the Sitra Achra, their theory of evil, and the idea of the Torah and the mitzvot. These are the big themes that dominate the, the literary text that is the Sefer Zohar. What we're going to pick up with next week is how this thing became scripture. How did anyone believe this was true? This book just appeared and people were like, yeah, that's, that's it. That's the roadmap for the recreation of all being is this book in the hands of this dude in Spain. And so people were skeptical. And we'll talk about how this became scripture, how this went from being a weird collection of texts in the late 13th century of Spain to becoming basically the cornerstone of Jewish theology. I'm pretty sure if you've ever heard any aspect of Jewish theology, it's been something coming out of the Sefer Zohar. So what we're going to do next time is we're going to pick up with how the Sefer Zohar was received, and we're going to begin discussing Lurianic Kabbalah, because one of the big things that Lurianic Kabbalah is going to do is it's going to be part of the systematization of the Zohar. The Zohar is not a systematic text by any stretch of the imagination. It is a, again, it's like, it, it's very difficult. It's not systematic. And so what ends up happening is people begin systematizing it. And you have a couple different generations of systematizers. And what ends up happening is that the definitive systematizer is going to be Etzek Luria through his student, Chaim Vital. So we'll talk about that process of systematization, that process of canonization, and why it became decanonized next time. So as we transition into what I would call the Zohar and its vicissitudes, to pun on Freud. Welcome back, and thank you for joining me as I explore the garden that is Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah. Again, if you'd like to support my work of providing accessible, free, and scholarly content on topics like Kabbalah, alchemy, and the occult, along with magic and hermetic philosophy, consider supporting my work on Patreon, or perhaps with a one-time donation. You can find those links below. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thank you for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.